Hey, good morning, friends, families, and all of you out there in Facebook land. Uh, we welcome you to worship this day. Let's prepare our, our souls for this time ahead with our opening song, One Thing Remains.
Hey, good morning, friends. Good to see you again. I'm Pastor Jim Beard here from the Bethel of Mound Church, greeting you this wonderful Sunday morning. Glad you are with us and praising our our Lord, who is, uh, well, we are at Bethel, which means the house of God, but I believe God is uh, in not only this house, but in your house as well, always welcoming you home and, and saying, hey, the love will never end. It never runs out. Come on home. So glad you're with us today here in God's house. Uh, this is uh, the first Sunday in February, and therefore it is a communion Sunday. Just a reminder, even over the airwaves, we celebrate communion together. So if you have a bread item, a juice item, uh, of those sorts that you may need to, to grab here at the beginning and just have that ready when we get to that point, just forewarning you, that is coming up today as well. It's, a, it's epiphany, which means we're looking for God, aren't we? Oh, yeah, we are. We're, we're wondering. Uh, we got to keep our eyes open and, and our hearts open to be able to experience uh, the, the living Lord in our midst in all the ways that God might show up. Last week, we, uh, we struggled with the reality of just how hard that is, though, to to sense the presence of God when, well, you know, when you're hurting or when life is not going well, when you're filled with sorrow, it, it was just it's so difficult. We, but we, we talked through that and figured things out. And so last week's assignment, you might remember, was to go, uh, go somewhere and, and be with somebody who's hurting and look for God there. Uh, I'll let you know, I, I was uh, surprised surprised uh actually someone came in and found a little hurt in me and it's like wow was god there y you better believe i could feel god's presence when that took place that conversation so uh, sometimes uh you you don't go because you can control it you you're just ready and open to be surprised by god and it's a lot better then you know uh we concluded that well g you know god is not far away god is as close as Oh, as they as they say that next breath, because God is the breath, the ruach that we breathe in. And there's God again and again. God enters into our world, weeps with us, um, even carries us. Yeah, even carries us when we just feel like we can't move another step forward when things are at their worst. So. Uh, last week, uh, Sue, who is who is not here, by the way, she is off um, sitting on some ice. Don't ask me why. It, it's not part of my my joy, uh, but it's part of her joy. So she's off having a little time away on a frozen lake. But uh, last week, she mentioned something called uh, footprints in the sand, and I thought, well, a lot of people know it, but maybe not maybe not everybody knows that uh, that kind of that prose type poem. And I thought, why don't, we, why don't we just start with that today, this week? Uh, let's just uh, begin our message with that wonderful poem called Footprints in the Sand.
trust that uh, our Lord, uh, whatever God promises, uh, they're true. Uh, we don't always understand it, uh, but but there's God carrying us when we we need carrying, <laughs> and if we can. Uh, have that assurance that, that God is that close all the time, that's a great comforting thing to know. And so today, um, we're actually conversely going to look at the opposite. <laughs> that uh, we're going to look for God in, in places, or maybe more uh, accurately in times, um, which are far, far away. Oh, yeah. This, too, actually can be a comforting reality. So uh, hang on. We'll take a look at this together. Let's begin our time, though, by centering. Center your heart. Center your soul. Get yourself comfortable and take a good breath again. Just breathe in God's uh, presence here as we think beyond each breath. Let God lead us, because God is, as they say, omnipresent. Uh, and, and so who, this journey with God, we are with God who spans all times, from our first breath to our last breath. Yeah, so let's, let's let this next uh, video, which you're about to, to watch, prepare your heart today for the message ahead. God, God is there with us through all of that, and, and God is with us through every single time in between, uh, something that no human probably can do. God does not just, God does not walk the same linear path which we walk. God is not, you know, uh, bound by, by some, what, uh, path of time, sort of like the, the time-space continuum, you know, that... Uh, uh, maybe if you're Star Trek fans, you'll go, hey, isn't it fun to play with that idea? But, but our reality is, no, we are on this continuum. And, but God is not. Uh, think about that. Uh, if God, however, can do this and can see what's coming, that is a source of great comfort. That should be also a place that we can rely on for our faith. God transcends all of this and in a sense is way ahead of us when it comes to what we're going through. Okay? So the Apostle Peter writes, hey, but do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years 
are like one day. There's a story about an economist who uh, heard that passage uh, shared and, and, and thought about that and thought, hmm, and so I wanted to ask God about that very idea. And so he said, Lord, is it true? Is it true that, uh, that a thousand years for us is like you know, just a minute for you? Just a minute? And the Lord said, yes. And then the economist said, and then, then like uh, a, a million dollars to us must be like uh, just a, a penny. A penny is all it is to you. Is that, is that how that works? And the Lord said, well, yes. And so then the economist asked, well, would, will you give me one of those pennies? And the Lord replied, all right, I will. Wait here a minute. Hope you caught the humor in that. <laughs> now, if we're, if we're truly to see God, then we must not only look at all these things we've been looking at so far, looking at uh, the ordinary places in our lives, and there's God. And in, in, in new places, and there's God. And the surprise, the, the presence of God is there. And even in places that we would least expect God to be, um, there is the Holy Christ. And, and we're surprised again. But we also have to train ourselves, train ourselves to look for God beyond the present moment, beyond the present realities, beyond our present circumstances. Yeah, God, guess what? God is already beyond that already and then knows what's coming. We must trust that, uh, that God, in essence, has another surprise, a, a, a surprise for us that's waiting for us that is ahead of us, to bless us beyond, uh, beyond what is ever happening here and now, and especially when the here and now is looking rather dismal. God, God's got that too. God's got that too. So, so many of us have a difficulty, difficult time seeing beyond just the immediate. It, it's right there in our faces, and we... we have this challenge or we have these life situations and, and, and it's hard to see beyond them sometimes but to trust God with them is important because God is way ahead of us uh, we, we lose our jobs for example and we lose our trust in God's care or, or someone may have a spouse who dies and and then believes that they will never never ever be happy again or the economy comes crashing down, and with it, our faith. If you, if you know what I mean, it's hard to sometimes see beyond the, the most present of circumstances to, to trust that God has got, a, got us covered with what lies ahead. These are, su are the surprises maybe that none of us want that has happened in our lives. But luckily for us, God is way ahead and can see beyond the troubles of the day. We catch uh, another epiphany uh, regarding Jesus' true identity as the Son of God when he talks to his disciples about, about difficulties that they are about to face. It's about to befall all of them very soon. And in, this is a passage in, in uh, John, the Gospel of John. It's a passage that is uh, part of the Holy Week story, actually. So we've already had the triumphant entry um, with uh, the Palm Sundays coming up. But, but uh, they're not quite to the, the, the terrible Good Friday scenes yet where uh, you know, the, the cross is going to be having agonizing tears take place for everyone so it's right in the middle and he's trying to prepare them to say look I, I know it's coming look ahead so between the two Jesus stops and he tries to prepare his friends he says this it, it, you, you've heard me tell you I'm going away and I'm and I'm coming back now, and if you loved me you would be glad that I'm on my way to the father because the father is the goal and purpose of my life. 
and I've told you this ahead of time, before it happens, so that when it does happen, the confirmation will deepen your belief in me. Now, I'll, I'll not be talking with you much more like this, because the chief of this godless world is about to attack. Hey, but don't worry. He has nothing on me. No claim on me, but so the world might know how thoroughly I love the Father. I am, I am carrying out my Father's instructions right down to the last detail. Get up, let's go. It's time to leave here. Uh, basically, uh, Jesus sees beyond what is about to come later this week, he, the forthcoming trials and tragedies and persecutions are, he can see them coming. He knows that he and God, though, are, are uh, way ahead of this. Uh, they, they can see what's coming, but they also see what's coming beyond it as well. Good Friday is not the final word. Yeah. Instead of um, so resisting or avoiding what is immediately before them. Jesus encourages um, encourages them to look beyond it, uh, to a God who's already got this and is, is already there, and be ready to bless them and surprise them. I essentially, he is saying the following. Trust me now. Trust me now, because I am way ahead of you, and all will be well again. Oh, that's hard to remember in the midst of it, but trust me now, I'm way ahead of you. All will be well again. You, you know, there's kind of a, a complimentary verse that we refer to in uh, the Older Testament, in, in the prophet Jeremiah, when he says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You know, if you don't recognize that verse, uh, I encourage you to look it up. It's, it's Jeremiah 29, 11. And, and I would just, I, you know what a great thing is, like write it on a little post-it note and, and stick it on your refrigerator or on your bathroom mirror and just look at it every day to remind yourself, so I've got plans, good plans for you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that single line, I think, is, uh, that's given a, uh, Something for people to hang on to and anchor themselves and uh, give them hope to get through some of those things that you, you just know the moment is not good, but God is part of the future as well. Yeah. I don't know, it helps trade in our eyesight maybe from, uh, instead of being filled with tears and in our, you know, our brows all furrowed and worried, I, I think it helps us release and relax and turn it over to God. This, uh, that single line, I know the plans I have for you, it, what's, what's so great about it, it's not just this little nicey nicey thing that you find on Hallmark cards, you know. Uh, <laughs> it, it isn't uh, something that's just a platitude. No, it, it because you have to understand, it, it's not just this one little line that sits there all by itself. It, this is a line that comes in the midst of a, of a highly dramatic, terrible, uh, challenging, uh, demoralizing story of the people. It, it, it's in the midst of it that gives it its depth. Um, it, it's, it's a story in which the people really need to, to know that God was way ahead of them and and that there is a future for them. And so it's, it's not just one little line all by itself. This is, this is a key line in the midst of a, a story that, if you're not familiar with it, we, we should take a look at it. Um, it <laughs> I mean, nobody likes to hear bad news, <laughs> especially kings and rulers. Ooh, we don't want to hear this. This is not good. It, it, it is the year five. 87 BCE, before the Common Era, and before the year is out, everything that these people have hoped for and built for a thousand years is about to implode. In 
so the story begins in Jeremiah. No doubt about it. Uh, handing the city over to the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylon, and he'll take it. And the attacking Chaldeans will break through and burn the city down. And so it was. Although they held out in Jerusalem for over, um, over a, close to a year, I guess it says, the, the enemy prevailed. All the Hebrew leaders are killed or maimed and hauled off in chains. All the people are, are dispersed, uh, spread out. You can't gather anymore. They are, they're made to go live in a foreign land with all the pagans out there, and they're not a community of people anymore. Um, I mean, it was, it was worse than that. The great temple of Solomon was razed to the ground. It was utterly destroyed. Croplands and uh, were destroyed. Uh, all the things that were there for their, their milk and honey, you know, the land flowing with abundance. No, not anymore. They plowed salt into the, the earth. You're not going to grow anything here. No way. This won't go away. Villages are burned. I mean, just the whole thing is decimated. Absolutely decimated. Okay? So in essence, Israel... Israel itself is eliminated, as far as they, the other side could see. Uh, the land promised by God is gone. The chosen people of God are dispersed and are assimilated elsewhere. The temple where God is supposed to be on earth was not there anymore. It certainly looks like it's all over, folks. And that's the background in which we have this, this thing you should write and put on your refrigerator. Where is God now? But where the people can only see disaster. Nothing. No future. Can't see anything past it. God sees more. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was God's message to the Hebrew people. It went like this. I will certainly bring this huge catastrophe on this people, but I will also usher in a wonderful life of prosperity. I promise. I promise. Fields are going to be bought here again. Yes, in this very country that you assume is going to end up desolate. I've gone to the dogs, unlivable, wrecked by the Babylonians. I think if I were back in that day, I, I would have heard those words and went, really? I don't, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't, and it, it, no, it's never coming back. I don't see it. It's, a, it's over. Their wonderful land, their whole thing they built their whole life on, was, it was over. Turned into a dump. It's not coming back the way things were. They can't sense that God is anywhere in their troubles, can they? No, nor can they see beyond the fog of the gloom and doom and, and destruction which seems to endlessly surround them. I, I just can't see past it. And, and then, indeed, uh, disasters and hardship cloud our vision. And, and we can probably relate to that in our own lives. Uh, Maybe on a more individual basis, but... Uh, Think about, uh, like, I think of the athletes since uh, the Olympics have begun and those who have dedicated uh, countless hours to things and then they have an accident or an injury that, that, that says they can't do this ever again. Uh, where's the future? It's, uh, it's when the career that you have been building and building and building for the last 10, 20 years, uh, suddenly it's a shut door and you have no place to go. I can't see the future. This is not good. I don't know where to turn. Or it's when, when the house, maybe, that you've lived in for 40, 45, 50 plus years, um, it has to be sold out from, from beneath you. No, 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 no. 
you can doubt that there will be a future. That there will ever be a place again or a purpose for us. Actually, we're just sort of saying, I don't, I don't think there's going to be ever again God's blessings in my life. But surprise. <laughs> oh, God is ready to keep blessing. Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah, who this book is uh, based, is, uh, is a prophet, okay? He has written all this down because this was his part of the story. He is one who had exceptional vision. Mm -hmm. He could see the hand of God hand of God at work doing things and he and he believed even when no one else believed and he was quite forthright and then then God gave Jeremiah a, a surprising directive <laughs> here's what you're gonna do Jeremiah trust me now basically because I'm way ahead of you and all will be well again is the essence of course of this directive and so even though Jeremiah is in jail at the time, he is in jail, even though the entire country is, is in danger and probably in shambles in some places, Jeremiah trusted this, this, uh, this edict, this, uh, this idea of God saying, trust what I'm about to tell you, this promise I'm going to make to you. Trust that God could see beyond all this trust that there's still more to come. God told him at that time while things were at their worst to go buy a piece of land. Go buy lots of land, the pieces of land. Acres upon acres of land and do it just outside of Jerusalem. In this wasteland? Yeah, do that. Buy acres and acres and acres of land, uh, Jeremiah. And, and so, guess what? Jeremiah did it. <laughs> Really? Yeah, he, he signed the papers, made it legal, um, stored them in these long-lasting clay jars. There they all are, and congratulations, Mr. Jeremiah. You now are the proud owners of some great swamp land in Everglades. <laughs> That's how it probably felt. God not only uh, is with them now, but is also way ahead of things and sees what that, uh, that maybe they have no way of seeing, but God can see it and says, trust me, trust me, trust me. And so God tells the rest of the Hebrew people also to trust him and do something equally as radical while they're off in Babylon and in exile all over the place. Here's what he tells them. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters and find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters increase in number there do not decrease also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which i have carried you into exile exile pray to the lord for it because if it prospers you too will prosper what no way they're the enemy no way i'm, I'm not gonna doesn't sound right just uh, you just don't want to hear this 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 doesn't sound like what you want if you were a, a beaten up broken angry refugee there oh no way but this is this is not what they want to see or feel or do and yet the lord tells them to not 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 look beyond look beyond where you are right now we need to get ready for the long haul. Don't look like uh, the whole future of your life is going to be filled with remorse. Don't look like filled with bitterness. Do not look with short-sightedness. Rather, make the most of this time. Make the most of this time with planting, with, yes, even marrying, and even praying for the prosperity of the, the, the Babylonians, because you're going to be there quite a while. You are going to be there quite a while, and God tells them, but then there will be a surprise. Then there will be a surprise. And the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope 
and a future. There it is. There's that passage. There's the one you're supposed to write down, put up on your, on your refrigerator there. Yeah. There it is in its context. And so it was. After years of living under this foreign flag, the people witnessed how, um, well, how great superpower Babylon was overcome by another superpower named Syria. <laughs> And then a royal decree went out. It was known as the Edict of Cyrus. And it was issued by their king in the year 539 BCE, ending the imposed exile. You can all go back, you Hebrew people, if you choose to. They were free to return to the, the land and to rebuild. And it, it, it took a lot of time, of course, to... to pack up and move back and rebuild, but they did, and once again, the land flowed with milk and honey, and once again, the chosen, chosen people were all gathered together and became numerous, and once again, the temple was rebuilt in Jerusalem, and it was, if we're to see, with, with uh, what's coming our way, then, and if we really want to see God right now, if that's what Epiphany is about, seeing God in our midst, we must train ourselves to look beyond the present moment okay we sometimes need to really work hard to see past our present circumstances okay we must trust that god has surprises surprises waiting for for us to bless us beyond even the here and now our task is is like those those exiles it is is not to sit around and mope and and let your life be filled with bitterness but, but it's to make the best of the circumstances is what i take from that story of our ancient ancestors make the best of the circumstances around us and trust that the ultimate the ultimate plans of god will come to be. Mm -hmm. There's a, I think it's a song. I, I didn't, didn't even pull this up, but I, I remember the verse goes something like, you know, will you believe in the sun even when it's not shining? <laughs> will you believe in, in love even when you don't feel it? Something like that, you know. Most importantly, I think it is, will you believe in God? Will you believe in God even when God is silent or when there seems to be nothing to believe in at all. Yeah, God knows. God knows the plans God has for your future and, and for Bethel's future and for our world's future. Believe, believe, and God's uh, surprises will eventually be revealed. Essentially, God um, wants us to do this, too. We've heard it several times today already. Trust me now, because I am way ahead of you, and all will be well again. Yeah. All of the details of, of our lives are real, but maybe not just ultimately real. We know God is what is ultimately real. So ponder all these ideas while you watch this next little video from uh, Barbara Holmes, who will share her thoughts on, on taking a transcendent leap. <laughs> it's going to take about three and a half minutes. I'll get ready for communion. We'll come back and share and celebrate together. We're that's expanding, we would probably lose our minds. And so instead, we make it small. The mortgage, the job, go to school, get a degree, all fine things, but not the ultimate reality. It's real, but it's not ultimately real. The 
if we thought of ourselves cosmically, there would be no war. There would be no oppression. If you begin to think of yourself as connected to something so much bigger than yourself, how in the world does a 30-year mortgage matter? Uh, Barbara, that sounds a little hippie-ish. Oh, right? OK. OK. My dream. Uh, you know, when you talk about those other things, they seem to be more manageable things that are sustainable. Um, and how, how can you win with that idea? That, I mean, it, it would, I hope it would be like that. But mm -hmm. What is there to win? We are sent here to progress down a journey to take a journey and to discover who we fully are so that we can connect to others who are fully themselves. If you don't know who you are, you're not going to be able to connect to anyone or anything. You live displaced from yourself, and it does sound kind of hippie-ish that if we could all just get out into the world and enjoy the cosmos, okay, fine. But the cosmos is right where you're standing. You have cosmologies of care around the elders in your family that you must take care of. You have cosmologies of oppression and traumatic wounds suffered by groups of people. That's a cosmology. Cosmology just isn't out in the stars. It's about creativity. It's about life. It's about where you find yourself situated and the constellations of people and things that are in that circle. That kind of sounds hopeful, but I'm still like, <laughs> what? Like, what does cosmology and science have to do with love and now and me being me? Right. And somebody's a person of faith, like, I didn't think you could talk about that. What does it have to do with salvation? <laughs> Well, God works in the cosmos. What? The creation itself comes out of cosmological events. So the church has shut that off, and we're still dealing with an 18th century kind of science. But the God of the universe, that's the last name of God, maybe, the God of the universe, is one who works in broad contexts and in tiny little contexts. So it's both and. What has it got to do with us? We have to think bigger. We have to begin to realize that our backs are not up against a wall. But the problem is you can't imagine yourself out of the box unless you can take a transcendent leap. And by transcendent leap, I mean you have to begin to imagine possibilities that project you into a place you've never been before. Now? I'm on now. There we go. Hmm. The transcendent leap. Yeah, think about that as we uh, enter into communion here today. Um, just uh, clarifying again that this, this is a table where maybe uh, you, you do have those epiphanies, uh, a table where by taking in the bread, the juice, the, the moment uh, is the place where you have an epiphany of, of Christ in your life, of who Jesus really said, this is who I am, and this is what God is all about, and, and it is a story that we keep reliving, and, and we just invite everyone into the story. And so even if you're just in, at home with your, your family there and you want to share in this, this is where I believe the transcendent God can come to you and uh, be part of all of this. So... Um, it's always good to remind yourselves to come humbly to these moments, and because this is a Black History Month, uh, it, it's, I just believe it's good for us to honor that. And so our, our prayer of confession, so that we, we ground ourselves in, in how we don't have it all together and we need God. Uh, I pulled this one from Derek Weber, who uh, has this, uh, this prayer of confession that I think is appropriate for our message today and where we're going. So... Let us pray. Oh God, why are we so afraid? God of history and of truth, why do we legislate against studying the past to examine our motivations and our behaviors with regard to race? Are we afraid that we, what we might find or do we know what is there and choose not? look 
God, I, I consider myself an educated person, rightfully proud of my degrees and achievements, but why was I never taught in school that on, on a pretense a, a white mob killed 300 black people in the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma 100 years ago? Why was I not taught that, that the only successful coup in the United States was against the lawfully elected biracial local government in Wilmington, North Carolina over 120 years ago, forcing out more than 100 elected black government officials and killing up to 250 black citizens and forcing out more than 100,000 black voters to flee from the city. I mean, is it right that we cover up these acts so that we do not damage our self-image? We have to know God. God of yesterday, God of today, God of tomorrow. Not, not so that we can hate ourselves or hate who we were, but so that we can be honest with ourselves and with those we continue to harm. Help us end the harm. Help us dismantle the systems that continue to oppress. Help us see through the eyes of history that we have work to do today. God of tomorrow, help us also to not be afraid so we can examine the past, recent and more distant, and face the hate of today so that we might learn to love better as we move forward, forward to the future you hold out before us. As Jesus taught, and in his name, and to his glory, we pray. Amen. And our faith uh, reminds us that, uh, yes, come with that humble heart and hear the words of forgiveness. All I do. And watch the forgiveness poured out for you, regardless of all that has taken place. And, and have that chance to start again and again and, and be about being the people of God. And, and so you have the, the story at communion time that is all about Thanksgivings, Thanksgivings, Thanksgivings. Look at all the Thanksgivings we have for God, from, from the cosmological God who created everything, uh, to the, the God of history who, uh, who, who sat there and was, uh, through Christ, you know, at a party, uh, taking bread and, and saying, this is going to be my body broken for you, and then taking a cup uh, of celebration and saying, this is going to be an even bigger celebration poured out for you. Uh, it's, it's my blood. I think of all that, the, the cosmological God doing that, but it's also the cosmological God in the here and the right now that we pray to, which is the Holy Spirit saying, um, bless these elements, dear Holy One. Bless the ones here, bless the ones uh, that are transcendent uh, across the space that divides us from those who are watching, even the times that separate us. Lord, bless all of their elements so that when they partake of them, they partake of you, we pray. Amen. And we partake of them to affirm our faith that the future is in God's hands. And so if you have a bread item, I invite you to take it with me and, and hold it up in thanksgiving and praise of your Lord and remind you that as you break it, Christ said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And take whatever juice you may have and pour it out into a cup if you have that, or just lift this up. And, and it, this is cup, too. It says, uh, this is my blood poured out for, for one and all, for the forgiveness of all the wrongs. Do this in remembrance of me as oft as you drink of it in my name. And so you have the elements now before you. I invite you to share them generously, wholeheartedly. Uh, take and eat uh, bountifully with each other. Uh, dip it in the cup if you'd like that, that ritual, but uh, come and, and celebrate what Christ has to offer. We'll be back shortly to uh, conclude this service with you.
enjoy communion together. One, holy, holy, holy one, thank you for this meal, in essence, to revive and remind us and reaffirm our faith in you so that we can go out, not just this day, but into our future, knowing that you are already there and that there is blessings to be had for all. All this we graciously and joyfully say, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Out today to, to live that faith be a part of it in your life and, and be renewed again uh, this whole series we keep giving you little assignments if for those who like more of that concrete uh, what do I got to do about this what should I try out and, and look for God why don't you take um, maybe 15 30 minutes whatever it's gonna take whatever you, you want to devote to it and and even just look back at your own life okay look back at your, at your own life and, and look for how God maybe was there seeing you through to the next part, next chapters of your life. Especially the times when you thought, ah, 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 this is the worst ever. I know if Sue were here, she would have a story about, you know, kind of having to, to leave this one place and, and filled with tears only to have her daughter say, ah, but it's, don't, don't worry, you just opened you another door and look what, where you are now. It, I mean, look for those times about how God maybe has seen you through and how uh, this wasn't so bad, I had to leave that, but now, now how blessed I have become. So it's kind of like just do a, a little uh, self-inventory for yourself. That's one way you can apply this today so that you can recognize God's hand along the way. Or, 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 there's another way you can apply your faith, and here's another opportunity for you. Like I said, February is a black history month i think it's always good for us to to pay attention to some of these things especially with the racial tensions that are so prominent in in our news and in our lives around us sometimes um so what are you going to do so here's one thing you can do you can if you liked um what that video had to offer barbara holmes okay she had we showed you the first three and a half minutes uh she's got another segment that comes along and um actually it it's it's kind of right right up, I don't know, halfway, not even, maybe it's a third of the way into it. Watch the whole thing, is what I'm going to say. There's a link on our website that takes you to the spot where you can watch it. It will be uh, able for you to be accessing it starting at 1130, I think, this morning, and it will be up there for two weeks. Okay, You can go right to the site. You don't need to subscribe to anything. You don't need to pay anything. They're going to ask for your, your, uh, your email, but they're never going to bother you with it. I don't even know why they're asking for your email, but they're just, <laughs> but they're saying they're never going to sell it. Don't worry about that. Just, you have access now through our account to go watch the rest of her, uh, her sharing there. And she tells this story about being a child and, and walking in the uh, protest with Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma. And I, I tell you, it was, it was an epiphany to me. I, I just still can't believe things like that happened or maybe are happening. I, it, it is. It's like, God, it, it just was, was all around as I watched that, that little segment. So maybe you're going to watch it too and become a little more sensitive to what the, what the black history has been about. And I, I just encourage you to take that type of step also and, and see and learn and feel God's presence even more. 
Um, next week, of course, we will be back. Um, I should mention this too. I almost forgot. I, I threw in some questions on our website. You know, you can click on it and go. Well, now what do I do with it? You go watch this, and maybe with your spouse or your friend or just uh, whoever. And here are three questions you can talk about it together too. That's just another great way to process some of these things. Okay, enough of that. Okay, next week we're back. We're back next week. It is called surprise. I am in risky places. Oh yeah. Sometimes we don't want to go there. <laughs> God's there. God is there. So, our departing song to send you out with is um, it's a song that reaffirms how God has been with, with us through all of like the life journey type of thing. Um, it's a song by Sidewalk Prophets, one of our contemporary Christian groups again. You know, it's gonna, so he's going to sing about being a child and then being a little older and being a little older and walking through. And there was God through, through all of this and how we can then have great confidence that God will be with us with whatever is coming forward because we know God has been with us in the past as well. So here we go. So ready to go off? Live your faith? Yeah, here we are in God's house, Bethel. Sending it out to your house, wherever that might be. May the Christ of the past, of the present, and definitely of the future continue to surprise you, continue to surround you with Christ's ever-lasting, ever-present.